right. Well, thank you so much to all the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd like to share a case that uh, I believe Jay has previously seen, uh, but this is a, what I call an OCT signature. And it's more of an imaging finding uh, that I'd like to share for this particular case. So these are my financial disclosures, which are not relevant to this content. And this is a 70 year old woman who presents with a three day history of blurry vision. In the right eye, the vision is 20-30, the intractable pressures are normal, but she does have one plus vitreous cell. And in the left eye, she has a visual acuity of 20-30 and uh, has two plus vitreous cell. And she's predominantly bothered by floaters in the left eye more so than that of the right eye. And when she comes to see us, uh, she has this shadowing appearance on the near infrared reflectance, which almost looks like floaters, which corresponds to her vitritis. And then on the OCT, she has this sort of enlargement uh, or sort of focal thickening of the interdigitation zone. And almost uh, it looks like there's like a dome elevation where the ellipsoid zone comes up. And because of the vitritis, she was referred to me and I saw this patient one week later. And now we see something that's relatively subtle, but the difference to retina specialists may be much more obvious. And that is she has this hyporeflective space uniformly between the interdigitation zone and the RPE in the right eye. And in the left eye, there's now that looks like there's this bleb of subretinal fluid. And then this sort of uniform splitting of the interdigitation zone and the RPE. And if we go through the scans, this is the right eye, both superior in the center and inferior to the fovea. And we can see that there is this uniform IZ RPE separation throughout the entirety of the macular cube. And this is just a close up to really highlight the fact that this is not an artifact, but rather a true splitting between the IZ and the RPE. And if you look at the left eye, we see some very similar findings, but now we can see that their EZ is much more thickened in this eye and uh, that blood of fluid is developing. And notably, there's no pigment epithelial detachment in the macular cube. And so I asked the audience just to think for a moment here, is there a particular diagnosis that you have in your mind at this window of time? And is this enough information? And for the sake of time, I'm gonna just move on here and tell you that this is a patient who has a past medical history significant for stage four metastatic melanoma. And she started in carafenib and benetinib, which are graft and MEK inhibitors respectively, a week prior to presentation. And she began experiencing floaters and hazy vision uh, three days prior, but she has no eye redness, photophobia, or flashing lights. And, and she is starting to develop a skin rash, but otherwise she's never had any prior ocular surgeries or history. So this is her FA on presentation. This is the right eye. And as we move on, we can see some mild disc leakage and then some focal areas of uh, fluorescence in the periphery corresponding to staining as well as leakage. And in the left eye, about 45 seconds in, we start to see this sort of uh, perivenular pattern of leakage uh, as well as some disc leakage. But notably, there's an absence of leakage or pooling in the macula where we saw that splitting of the IZ and the RPE. And so if we wanted to be comprehensive, we could create a differential diagnosis that really includes immune related adverse events, secondary to MEK or BRAF inhibition. We could include infectious etiologies or inflammatory etiologies, but I would argue we can exclude CSC in this because of the absence of the pigment epithelial detachment. And it's one of the notable uh, reasons for why that probably should not be on the differential diagnosis. And then uh, we checked a quantifuron and a syphilis, which were both negative. And so MEK and BRAF inhibition associated uveitis and retinitis uh, varies from low-grade anterior uveitis to a pan-uveitis with serous retinal detachments. And specifically with BMETNIB, the vast majority of individuals will have some pockets of subretinal fluid. And this was further characterized by Jasmine Francis at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, where she identified that subretinal fluid between the intact RP and e, uh, IZ occurs without associated choroidal thickening. And this may serve as a sensitive marker for early immune-related adverse events. And these are sort of the four patterns that have been described. And notice this pattern on the, on the bottom, that is not our patient, but it is eerily similar to what our patient looked like at presentation. And so then the question is, do we discontinue MEK and BRAF inhibition and start oral steroids? Well, it's really important to realize that this is a life-sustaining treatment that we really don't want to withhold if we can. And so we opted for initial treatment with diflupredinate uh, six times a day, followed by intravitreal dex. And I've 
I've been following her now for about nine months, and notably, she would not be alive if it wasn't for these treatments at this point. And so she's received dexamethasone uh, times three in both eyes. Her visual acuity is 20-20 in the right eye, 20-25 in the left eye. And you know, one question that got previously brought up is, do you need to continue these treatments? And so this is her, she then moved to Florida to spend some time with her family. And she advised, uh, we advised her to continue treatment with the retina specialist there. But then she calls me about 13 weeks after her treatment and she says her vision is blurry. And so now 14 weeks after she's now back in my office, we see the splitting of the IZ as well as that dome shaped fluid and she receives bilateral intravitreal dexamethasone. So this splitting of the subretinal fluid without a pigment epithelial detachment is specific and potentially pathognomonic for an immune related adverse event. And this finding is not specific to a particular drug. And I believe that treatment of these immune related adverse events should incorporate local therapy to allow continued life sustaining treatment. So thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And I'd like to also acknowledge one of my residents, uh, Sagar Pundit, uh, who helped me put this together and he'll be starting his uh, uh, VR training uh, at Will's Eye in Philadelphia. Thanks, Yesha. Very interesting.